Hi, I'm Professor Kinney, and today we're going to take a look at the subject of iconography. And that's really about representing objects, ideas, and actions using simple abstract graphics. In the contents of this lecture, we're going to take a look at a brief overview of the entire subject, then we'll delve into its history, and then we'll discuss about the design factors uh, that make for good iconography, and then look a little bit at the process of icon creation. Iconography has a very long past that begins with the emergence of modern humans and cave art, like this example here in Altamira, Spain. The oldest evidence comes from the Fertile Crescent, and that lies between modern-day southern Iraq and the Egyptian Nile Delta, all the way up to the south of Turkey, really, uh, where the earliest known writing systems emerged. These writing systems set the stage for massive social, political, and economic changes that resonate down to modern-day systems of writing, including representation of complex ideas and tasks that are accessible to us on our smartphones in the form of user interfaces. Since the dawn of our species, Homo sapiens have been driven to leave our mark. Our burning desire to communicate inspired our ancestors to leave simple hand stencils in caves like this one on the island of Sulawesi, Indonesia. It allowed us to reach through time. The Fertile Crescent lies between Mediterranean shores of southern Turkey and the Nile Delta of modern-day Egypt and over to the Persian Gulf in the southeast. These rich agricultural areas boast the earliest known continuous human settlement where we see the emergence of early forms of architecture and writing. Samaria, in modern-day southern Iraq, was the birthplace of the writing system known as cuneiform. Here we see clay tokens, and these were early systems used, uh, they were formed out of clay, and they were used as accounting tokens. These were abstract representations of things like livestock, produce, and their various quantities. It was, in effect, an early system of monetization or exchange. Cuneiform was a system of writing created by using a reed with a triangular point on it to form triangular impressions on clay tablets. Typically, the earliest documents were for commercial purposes, recording market transactions of livestock and food. The image shown here is from a much later inscription of Xerxes, son of the great King Darius of Persia, and that was found near the modern city of Van, Turkey. It's a trilingual inscription written in Old Persian, Babylonian, and Elamite on the far right. Hieroglyphs emerged around the same time as the Sumerian writing system, probably within about 100 years or so of each other. And this system contained a mixture of highly abstracted symbols and representational pictures. Pictographs were symbols representing objects, Logographs were symbols representing words or syllables. Alphabetic symbols functioned in much the same way as our present alphabet, insofar as they represented sounds. And then we had ideographs, which represented concepts or ideas. The invention of paper like papyrus made record keeping much more flexible and less burdensome. This is typical of what we see in the Nile Delta modern-day Egypt. The notion that values and ideas could be abstracted and exchanged using mere pictures and symbols to represent their essential sources was a novel one, and it paved the way for new social and economic modes of activity. It enabled things like state religions, empire, and money, something we all like. By 1600 BCE, Phoenicians that's near the modern-day Lebanon, rose to great power as a trading nation by greatly simplifying the system of writing. They introduced what's known as the 22-character Phoenician alphabet. It's the roots of our own alphabet today. 
This enabled the Phoenicians to represent the languages of their trading partners as a series of sound symbols. It was the world's first sound recording technology. Most systems at that time had thousands of characters that had to be learned and memorized. This singular innovation democratized communication by granting unprecedented access to writing. And that was a field that was jealously guarded by palace scribes who were nearly as powerful as the pharaohs and kings that they represented. Not everybody was comfortable with this outsourcing or this virtualization of value and meaning. It is said that the god Toth, who was the Egyptian god of fire and industry, offered Pharaoh the gift of writing in order to record his history. Surprisingly, Pharaoh refused, citing that writing down their history would cause his people to become forgetful and lazy. A little bit later on, in Greece, Aristotle in the third century found similar resistance to embracing the system of writing. Now, the early Mycenaeans, this is over in Crete, had the linear B writing system as far back as 1200 BCE, but they rejected it and returned to oral modes of communication. The Greeks valued oratory and rhetoric over writing. It's hard to imagine that the Greek chorus was responsible for memorizing their entire history. While the epic histories found in the Iliad are commonly attributed to one author, that being Homer, they were actually a collection of oral stories that were collectively memorized and recited in a relay fashion at key festivals. In oral cultures, history was both shared and embodied. You lived and breathed it, and it lived and died with you. Memory was participatory, and you simply had to be there to experience it in their shared manner. Much like a live concert today, with the notable exception that every Greek was a part of the act, not just a passive consumer. Writing enabled perspective, the point of view of the author. History was detached from time and from the rest of humanity. It was no longer a shared phenomenon. It was written by the few and could project its message down through time to the present day. Writing and printing allowed us to disconnect from our history and defer its telling to expert authors. It was the end of oral culture. The world changed from being the way we saw it to the more singular, the way I see it. The internet and social media connected the modern world in such a radical way that it enabled us to return to participating in the conversation, ushering in what media theorist Walter Ong referred to as secondary orality. Traditional book literacy that we associate with reading and writing have shifted dramatically today to accepted shorthands devoid of the structural concerns for spelling and grammar that define more traditional modes of communication. Even our traditional reliance on sources of expertise or truth are being challenged as we move into the more democratic yet potentially less accurate realm of mass and potentially manipulated opinion. We have reverted back to a quasi-literate state that relies on minimum text supported by an ever-growing range of icons. It began with the advent of home computers. Driven by the need to make them more accessible and user-friendly, a system of clickable and draggable icons were made to represent very complex sets of computer commands and actions. This was referred to as the GUI, or graphical user interface a field of design that continues to exert influence on the way in which we interact with machines and with one another. With environmental, we have hazard icons in our living environment that help keep us safe. We see them every day. Um, skulls and crossbones indicating poison on spray cans and various other dangerous liquids indicated for fire hazard and so on. These we call environmental graphics. 
There's also the area of wayfinding. Wayfinding is a system of simple graphics and text elements that help us to ascertain our location and our direction. Of course, everyone's familiar with this. Uh, emoticons, uh, they help us to express our emotional states. They're used quite frequently in texting. We interact with icons on a daily basis by tapping or swiping to connect us to over 3 billion people worldwide and a digital marketplace offering millions of products and services. We live in Walter Ong's world of secondary orality, where we are present, connected, and participate in a campfire conversation without actually being physically present. We are connected and disconnected at the same time. Today, icons are meticulously designed on a grid that typically matches the resolution of the screens on which they will be used, with no elements being thinner or smaller than one picture element or pixel in width or height. Anything smaller than that may not be rendered on the screen. So what are the qualities of a good icon? For them to be effective, they have to be simple, memorable, recognizable, familiar, meaningful, and last but not least, and the most difficult to capture, universal. For simplicity, good icons are a distillation or abstraction of information. This is really where that design saying less is more really is applicable. The trick is to take out enough information but still retain the essential form of the thing being represented. Using simple lines and basic shapes is a great way to ensure a simple interpretation. The more complex a graphic is, the harder it is to stick in memory. For instance, the coat of arms on the left is too complex to make it into short-term memory, let alone into long-term. Note the instance of Charlie Chaplin on the right has been distilled down to its bare bones. One might argue that the hair could be removed without compromising the recognizability. Good icons should be memorable, and this kind of connects with simplicity. The famous Nike swoosh that we see here on the left is an abstraction of the wing of Nike, the Greek goddess of victory. Hence, we can see the association with sport. A more illustrative version could have been done, however, it wouldn't have been as memorable. The litmus test for memorability is if you can look at something for a few seconds and then draw it from memory, then it works on that level. Companies spend billions of dollars exposing you, the public, to their images on a daily basis. This persistence of exposure literally burns it into your long-term memory, hence the term branding with the reference to burning a sign of ownership into something, be it cattle or, in the most sinister example, the practice of branding African slaves as property. And you can see from this chilling image on the right-hand side, this was an actual slave brand. The content of an icon should be immediately recognizable. The icons in this example go from being least to most recognizable as we go from left to right. The Jimi Hendrix icon on the far left is difficult to recognize because it has insufficient information. The Zorro icon in the middle may be recognized due to the cowboy look with the mask. However, it could be the Lone Ranger. We're not sure. The addition of a sword might aid in the recognition factor. The final one on the right is indisputably Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. Icons should be derived from things that are familiar to us so that they're already to the mind. Instantly, we can recognize this as being an envelope. Envelopes are familiar to us, as are the connotations associated with envelopes, like sending or mailing, writing, communications, etc. The meaning of an icon is what is reconstructed in the mind of the viewer based on their exposure to and experienced with the sign and the things to which that sign might refer. There are two types of meaning. Denotative, or the literal meaning, would refer to either the Apple Corporation, in this case, we've got an apple with a bite out of it, 
or the apple, the fruit we eat. So these are the literal meanings. Connotative or implied meaning, on the other hand, refers to other less straightforward connections that we might make with the sign, such as the idea of learning or knowledge. Now this final aspect of good icon design, universality, is the most difficult to achieve. Due to differences in language and culture, the meanings of signs can vary. And for this reason, creating a universal system of signs is really challenging. For instance, using a thumbs down to signal disapproval in Japan would be considered rude. It's the equivalent of giving somebody the middle finger in North America. And you want to hope that wherever you travel in the world, that if you do need the bathroom and you need to get there in a hurry, that they're all on the same page, as it were, with respect to their iconography. Universality can be important, particularly in stressful or emergency situations. So when creating an icon, in order to keep them simple and consistent, it's best they be designed using a grid. Keep line widths consistent, use simple primitive shapes such as ellipses, rectangles, and lines. Sets of icons are available for almost every conceivable theme. And they're available online from a number of sources. If you're developing graphical user interfaces or UIs for either iOS or for Android devices, if you go to their websites, you can actually download pre-drawn icons for use in developing your applications. This helps those companies like Apple and Android to maintain a visual consistency in the digital products that they're offering. Material design is a term that was coined by Google. UI, or user interface design, is the field of design concerned with developing icon systems for users of digital services from smartphones, tablets, and computers to dashboards, uh, information kiosks, and so on. Material design, in this case, is a design language that Google created in 2014. And that language governs a system for building bold and beautiful digital products. By uniting style, branding, the way in which you interact, and the way in which things move, and binding them to a consistent set of principles, components, etc., icons typically come in five modes. When you're shopping for them on the Google platform, they're typically filled, outlined, rounded, sharp, and two-tone. We can see a mix of those styles on the slide. That's it for now. Thank you.